This is for these guys. Uh, first of all, first of all, let me thank all of you for coming and. Jane, I first want to say thank you to the people of Kentucky for allowing us to be their governor and first lady for the last eight years. It has been both the most challenging time of our lifetime as well as the most rewarding time of our lifetime. Uh, when we look back on when we came into this office in 2007, uh, I think we were at a place where Kentucky had lost a lot of faith, Kentuckians had lost a lot of faith in their government, and the historic recession had just hit us all in the face, uh, and we had some tremendous struggles to go through, just like families all across Kentucky did at that time. But you look at eight years later and what a difference eight years makes, because uh, we now have some tremendous momentum in so many areas uh, that affect the quality of life of Kentuckians. When you look back at the economy in 1987, 1988, our unemployment got up to about 11 uh, percent. Today is, it is at 5 percent and it's lower than the national average. Uh, we've got tremendous momentum in terms of our economy. The uh, jobless rate, as I said, is at 5 percent. We revised all of our business incentives in 2009, and as a result of all of those efforts, last year we were chosen as the number one state in the country for job creation and economic development. Uh, we've set export records four years in a row. Uh, our economy is really on a roll. Uh, in education, uh, we have gone from a college and career readiness rate in 2010 of about 34 percent to today it is 62 percent and still climbing. We've almost doubled our college and career readiness rate. Uh, our graduation rate is now in the top 10 in the country at 86 percent and we raised our dropout age thanks to the First Lady's efforts over about a six-year period. Uh, from 16 to 18 to keep our kids in school and to make sure that they understand what a high school degree means in terms of their future. Uh, in health care, I think it's obvious what's going on there. Uh, today, for the first time, we can say that every single Kentuckian has access to affordable health care. That in a generation will make a huge difference uh, in the Commonwealth of Kentucky. Uh, we have had a tremendous number of infrastructure projects that will make a difference for generations to come. One of the biggest being the Louisville Bridges project, uh, a project that was 40 years in the making and was at a standstill until a Republican governor in Indiana, Mitch Daniels, and I got together and decided that we were going to get the job done. And we did get the job done. And one of those bridges, the downtown crossing, is getting ready to open up uh, next month. And then the, uh, the upriver uh, crossing will be open uh, uh, in about a year after that. Uh, the Mountain Parkway is going to be four-laned. I-65 is going to be six-lane all the way from uh, across our borders. Uh, two new bridges down across Kentucky Lake and Lake Barkley. Uh, and one of the biggest infrastructure projects for the future is the high-speed broadband project where in the next two years or so, because of a public-private partnership, uh, we're going to have high-speed broadband in every single community in this Commonwealth. And that is going to open up even our smallest communities to economic development, to entrepreneurship. It's going to allow our people to do business around the world, sitting in their own homes or in their small offices in these small communities. So from an economic development standpoint, that's going to be a major uh, boost to our economy. So Kentucky has tremendous momentum. Now is the time to put the foot on the accelerator and not on the brake. And I'm hopeful that we will keep our foot on the accelerator as we move forward. Because if we do, uh, Kentucky is going to take those rankings that we have always looked at and said, oh gosh, thank God for Mississippi. And we're going to be right at the top in so many of those rankings. We've already moved up and we're headed in the right direction, but we've just got to keep it going. So uh, I appreciate you all coming and we're open to your questions.
Governor, First Lady, thank you for taking time to meet with us. Um, Governor, you know, you're leaving office now after eight years, and you list these all these accomplishments that you just listed. I think most public opinion polls show you have a pretty high favorability in the state among the voters. And yet, you know, Matt Bevins is governor, going to be governor, strong Republican majority in the Senate. It looks like the House is in danger. Uh, why, why is that? Why uh, do, you, do you think the voters have rejected your policies now? And why do you think, if you've had all these successes, why, why are Democrats in your party and your policies not winning at the ballot box? Well, first of all, I think uh, our policies are the right policies for Kentuckians, and I think Kentuckians appreciate that. I think you see that we have those high approval ratings because of what we've done and that Kentuckians like what we've done. You know, elections are decided on a lot of factors. Uh, oftentimes, um, very little on issues. Uh, I, I thought it was interesting to read the interview that one of the national newspapers uh, had with a guy from Pikeville not long after this election. And this fellow is sitting in a health care clinic, getting health care for the first time in his life, and tells the interviewer how necessary and essential this is to his well-being and, and to his survival. And then the interviewer asked him who he voted for, and he said, Matt Bevin. And she said, why? And he said, well, you know, he was, I kind of looked at him as an outsider, and I just thought that'd be good to have an outsider in Frankfurt. And then the interviewer said, well, don't you realize that he campaigned on maybe doing away with this health care you're getting right now? And he said, oh my God, I hope he doesn't do that because I need this to survive. And I just think that is an example of how a good part of the electorate and the voters look at campaigns. Most of them don't pay a lot of attention. Uh, you know, they're busy making a living and trying to keep their kids in school and food on the table and a roof over their heads and they, and, and they pay a little attention as we go along. But I don't think a lot of voters are zeroed in on issues. Um, and then we had a 30% voter turnout. Uh, and so the winner on that Tuesday got 16%, I think, of the eligible voters to vote in Kentucky. So. Uh, that's, that's a little sad, no matter who wins. That's sad that we only have that much voter turnout. But I don't think you can take any particular election and that it reflects very much on issues or anything else. I think you have to look at any number of things that affect an outcome. Governor, you mentioned the challenges that you've had over the last uh, eight years. What's been your most difficult day in office? No. Uh, one of the most difficult periods that I had in office was the horrendous ice storm that came through Kentucky in 2009. Uh, you know, we knew it was coming. We didn't know the severity of it for sure. But when it hit, it basically, I think, put 110 of our 120 counties into an immediate state of emergency. All the electric lines came down. All the power was off everywhere. Uh, you know, people were really devastated, and uh, uh, we were, we just had to start from scratch to try to get the state back up on its feet and to try to make sure our people were safe. Uh, I called out the entire National Guard. Uh, I know when I talked to the uh, Adjutant General at first, I said, how many do we have out already? And he said about 1,500. And I said, how many do we have in all? And I've forgotten the number, 7,500, 8,500. I said, call them all up. Uh, we're going to need them. And we put those National Guard men and women out there in those communities, and they went door to door uh, checking on people. Uh, we had hospitals uh, that had no electricity, and some of them didn't have generators as backup. And so we were working with FEMA and with uh, uh, Homeland Security uh, and with the Corps of Engineers to try to find generators from around the country. And uh, we kept getting conflicting stories, and so um, I knew Janet Napolitano, who had been appointed Homeland Security Secretary um, just a few weeks before that. And she'd been a governor in Arizona, and that's the way I knew her. Uh, and I just picked up the phone and called her, and she said, what can I do? And I said, I need you to get the Corps and FEMA on the phone, and you tell them we've got to have those generators in the next hour and a half, or you know, you're going to lop their heads off. And I probably used more strong language than that. Uh, but I mean, this was a crisis, and people's lives were in the balance. Uh, we got those generators. And, and you know, we dug our way out of that. But 
that was uh, that was one of the most devastating times I think of the entire eight years, and uh, it it was a, it was a crisis that I'd never faced before in my life. It looked like a war zone. Yeah, we went down to Paducah about three or four days into the ice storm because you just couldn't get anywhere. Uh, ice covered everything, and I we're, cell phones. Yeah, cell phone towers were down. Uh, you couldn't even communicate by cell phone, and so. Uh, we flew down on a Black Hawk helicopter, and at the Paducah Airport, we put down and we slid. We had skids on. We slid all over the runway until the propeller stopped. That's that's how slick it was. And then you you got in a car, and we went to kind of see what was going on. And you know, trees and everything were just. You all remember some of this in your own communities. You couldn't even get by roads. Uh, there was one gas station in all of Paducah that was open, and there was a line of cars about three miles long waiting to try to get in to get a little gasoline. Uh, it was it was really a sight to see. But we dug our way out of it, and uh, and you know most people uh, told me afterward, they said, you know, when I saw the National Guard, either you know coming up the street in a Humvee or just walking up the street, they said, you know, we knew we were going to be okay. Because we just, you know, we just knew they were there and they were there for us, and we were going to be okay. So, quite an experience. Governor Bashir, clearly the Medicaid expansion and the Connect is going to be one of the biggest parts of your legacy. And putting all politics aside, there are 3,089 Frankfort and Franklin County residents here who benefit from the Medicaid expansion. Personally, for, from your point of view, if Matt Bevan does his best to, to d diminish that, what is your personal takeaway from that? Well, first of all, I'm hopeful that the incoming governor, being a business guy that he is, and I've urged him to do this, I said, I just want you to look at the facts, look at the data, because we've done studies, and, and there are not just projections now, there are actual data from the first full year of operation of expanded Medicaid and, the, and our health benefit exchange. And the actual data says we've created 12,000 new jobs already. You know, that's, that's a fact. That's not made up and that's not my talking points. Uh, that's a fact. You know, we've got four or 500,000 people that have health care coverage, most of them for the first time in their lives. All of these screenings that people can now access, screenings for all kinds of cancer, uh, cholesterol, diabetes, uh, you know, all of the different preventive screenings. I mean, they're going through the roof right now. People, for the first time, are taking advantage of those. And what's, what's that going to do for us? That's going to catch chronic conditions before they get bad. That's going to catch things early on. People are going to be able to manage their conditions. They're going to keep out of the emergency room and out of inpatient days. And not only is their quality of life going to improve, but all of the money that we would otherwise pay as taxpayers to take care of those people in that last six months of life when it's the most expensive because we didn't catch that chronic condition or disease, you know, we're all going to be better off. So uh, I'm urging this incoming administration to take a hard look at this. Forget the ideology. Forget which president passed the Affordable Care Act, because that shouldn't make any difference. I mean, this is about the people of the state. This is about their health. This is about their future. And, and I'm very hopeful that they will do that, uh, because there's about a half a million Kentuckians out there who uh, now have health care that if they jerk that out from under them, um, you know, that's inconceivable to me that anybody would do that. Governor, I don't want to exclude the First Lady since she's sitting Move there. I right know you're here. very proud of the First Lady and her efforts with Horses and Hope and other things that she has done during your eight years. And can you talk about uh, the Pride for Awareness for Breast Cancer Research and Education? You want me to? Yes. That's you. <laughs> well, you know, the, the First Lady's office has been, had been involved with breast cancer education and awareness um, s since Mrs. Patton, Judy Patton, really started it. And um, it was just, it was kind of, again, a no-brainer when we have some of the highest incidences of cancer. And breast cancer is, a, is one of the leading causes of death in women in Kentucky. 
So um, I, I wanted to continue something that was a good project. You know, we're, we feel very strongly if there is a good program, then you build on it. You don't just tear it down and start a new one. So uh, building on that, I paired it with my passion, which is the horse, which is um, very appropriate in Kentucky. Um, and we developed a program where we provided care uh, mammograms for people that work on the backside of the track. And we coupled that with other um, health screenings and clinics, and um, it has had an amazing success. It's spread beyond just the, the racetracks. It's, it's gone on to many other um, equine events and farms and really helping a segment of the population that, that provide our equine industry with um, the significance that it is, both economically and, and um, pride in our state, giving, that, the, giving them an opportunity to try to be healthier themselves. And um, as a part of that, which I'm really excited about, we've just completed raising over a million dollars for a new um, van mobile unit that will be screening for seven different kinds of cancer. This will be for men and women. It will, be, it will not be just the horse industry. It will be underserved um, population all around, particularly the Louisville and, and um, Central Kentucky area. We're hoping perhaps that we've been so successful in this that we might even have a second van that will probably travel even further out. But this is a part of this health care. This is an opportunity for these screenings for these people. And because they have the expanded Medicaid and, and the, the insurance, if something is detected in these screenings, they will be connected with resources within their community to be able to get the treatment they need. Uh, and uh, again, just another step to change the dynamics of the health in Kentucky. Let me brag on this lady. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Recovery Kentucky. I don't know if all of you know about Recovery Kentucky, but uh, when we came into office, uh, Governor Fletcher had started it. And at that time, I've forgotten how many um, the plan centers. The was to have 10. Uh, there was a plan. And, and there might have been three or four already started. There are now 14 of these Recovery Kentucky centers. I think uh, that seven and seven, is it? Or, or seven women, seven men, and we've got three more on, on, on the books. Yeah. And this is all about substance abuse and alcoholism and treatment for that. And uh, it works. You know, it, it's, a, it's a program that works. And um, we picked up on Governor Fletcher's program. And Don Ball uh, was uh, one of the chairs of it. And Jane uh, co-chaired with Don. And, uh, and it, it's really made a huge dent in the whole um, addiction problem in Kentucky. And we combined that with you know legislation that drove the pill mills out of the state and made the Casper system mandatory so that we could track prescriptions and we've really made a big dent in prescription drug abuse and then of course along comes heroin and so this last session we we uh, were able to put a dent in that by some legislation to start attacking that and so Jane has led the charge in just a, a, a whole lot of areas. Uh, this place you're sitting in right now, the governor's mansion, she just finished raising a million dollars to put into an endowment to take care of this place. It's 100 years old as of last year, and that million dollars will help take care of it for 100 years into the future. Uh, this is a treasure for the people of this state, and, and we, we wanted to take care of it, and it's always hard to get taxpayer money to to do something like that, and so she's raised a million dollars uh, that will be in an, in an endowment to uh, to take care of it. Uh, adventure tourism, you know, she has gone all over the state advocating for trails and almost single-handedly created the Dawkins Line Trail up in eastern Kentucky, which when it's finished is going to be one of the longest uh, rails to trail uh, projects in the country, 36, 36 miles long. Two tunnels. Two tunnels. And it's going to bring in thousands of visitors into eastern Kentucky every year uh, who will spend their money and, and help the economy uh, up there. So uh, Jane Bashir has been a very active first lady. Let me add something to the, to the um, Recovery Kentucky. When the Attorney General received a settlement 
of, um, and I don't, uh, I think it was forty million dollars from um, a pharmaceutical, two pharmaceutical companies. We were able to, uh, thanks to the judge's um, um, decision, we were able to take that and parlay that into the Recovery Kentucky Centers. But we also parlayed it into. Um, funding for adolescent recovery, which we had very little of in this state. And um, at that point, at, at the point in time when we were doing this, there was no Medicaid expansion. So unless, you're, unless you were wealthy and could put your child in a um, paid recovery kind of program, unless they declared your child mentally ill, you couldn't get any care for them as far as substance abuse was concerned. This, with the expansion of Medicaid for our people in Kentucky, and the monies that we received, a portion of the monies that we received from this settlement, we were able to fund a number of centers across the Commonwealth that are now working with adolescents in recovery, which means if we, you know, my belief is if you, it's just like education, if you get them early and give them the tools that they need, then you don't have to take care of them on the other end when they are adults and non-productive. So um, that, that's been a, a very crucial thing, and that's one of the things that frightens me about if Medicaid expansion disappears. It's the children. You know, in domestic violence, uh, we really had no money early on because of the recession, and Jane organized a program called Shop and Share, where I think with Kroger, and, and they go out once a year, and people in the groceries go buy something extra and donate it to the domestic, uh, uh, violence, violence shelters. Four million dollars. She's raised four million dollars in goods and services for that. Um, she spearheaded the, uh, the domestic violence uh, legislation and kept working on that for the last however many sessions until we finally got it passed. And the same thing with the dropout age. Um, we tried to raise our dropout age for five years running, I think, and finally the sixth year we got it there. Uh, and it's because of her persistence. Uh, she doesn't take no for an answer. Legislature is going to be happy to see me gone. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Governor, if you can pinpoint, what would you say has been your biggest regret? I know it's kind of difficult to necessarily pinpoint one. Oh, you know, I, I'm sure there's been a number of things uh, uh, that we would maybe do over again if we had the, uh, the opportunity, but I think my, my biggest regret, uh, probably too, not, not being able to make any meaningful uh, progress in tax reform for the state um, that's sorely needed in Kentucky, that doesn't necessarily mean raising your taxes, it does mean broadening the tax base so that we, in the long term, create more revenue as our economy grows because the state does need more revenue to invest in things like education uh, and, and things that will continue this momentum that we're, that we're on. Uh, the other thing I regret is not being more successful in passing some kind of gaming. Um, I still think that that would be a smart move for the state. Uh, we were able to get historic racing uh, into our uh, racetracks to where they can have the historic racing machines, uh, and that has helped uh, the, ra the race industry, it's helped with purses. Uh, they're now able to have more attractive purses and, and have better horses and more horses come and race at our racetracks. But it hadn't helped much in terms of, of uh, revenue for the state. Uh, Governor, I'd like to get your take on your progress with pensions and then address uh, the criticism that not enough was done to address the crisis uh, in, during your term. Well, first of all, you've got to put the whole pension issue in context. Um, we, we have a big unfunded liability today in both the Kentucky retirement system and the teacher's retirement system. The Kentucky retirement system uh, is a lot worse off uh, than the teacher retirement system, but there's unfunded liability in both. That unfunded liability was created over 20, 25 years, uh, a little at a time, and a lot of different factors went into creating that unfunded liability. You know, uh, investments not doing as much as you anticipate that they do. Uh, the legislature not putting as much money in as the actuaries say should go in because, well, golly, we can always do that next year. 
you know, all of those kind of things go together and created uh, this big hole uh, with an unfunded liability. Uh, we have addressed the Kentucky retirement systems, the big system, twice early on in my administration uh, with some minor tweaks and then, uh, oh, about, what was it, three years or so ago uh, when we brought the Pew Foundation in, uh, or experts in the pension situation, got Republicans and Democrats together and worked through what we needed to do in order to get our system back on its feet. Now, that doesn't mean that the system would be back on its feet overnight. It took about 20 years to get into this mess. It's going to take about 20 years to get out of it. But what kind of path do we put ourselves on so that if we follow that path every year, we'll be out of this and we'll be okay? And the Pew Foundation came up with those answers and we adopted those answers. We changed benefits. We agreed to put in the actuarially required contributions every year. We are doing that. And so over a period of years now, the Kentucky retirement system is going to be okay if we stick with what we said we would do, and we have so far. The next thing you turn your uh, attention to then is the teacher's retirement system, because while not in as bad a shape in terms of unfunded liability as the big system was, uh, it's still getting there, and you need to catch it before it goes any farther. Um, I created a task force this last summer and got Republicans and Democrats on there with some consultants, and they're working through a, a list of options, uh, and they need to address that this coming session. And it's going to have to be a long-term solution. Again, you're not going to turn around overnight and fill that hole up. What you're going to do is come up with a plan that over a period of years, we, we come out of this and we get it on the right path and we're okay. Uh, that's the way the solutions to these pension things always work, and that's the only way they work. There's not enough money in this country to write a check overnight and just put it into a pension system. You know, nobody does that. Uh, you have to do it on a gradual basis, but it can be done. We've done it now with the Kentucky retirement system, and I fully expect that the incoming administration and the legislature will be down and uh, will be able to sit down this coming session and fashion a solution that will do the same thing for the teachers. Three-part question, Governor. Uh-oh. <laughs> they, they must have told you you only got one, so you've got three parts of one. Right. Same subject, though. Um, how much do you think the Kim Davis controversy uh, contributed to what happened with the election? Would you have done anything differently? And you declined until now to talk about your personal opinion of same-sex marriage. Will you give that now? Well, first of all, I think this election, as I mentioned before, uh, there was a whole lot of factors that, that went into it. I'm sure that there were some people somewhere who made their decision based upon the same-sex marriage issue. I mean, just like they make their decision on a dozen other issues. How much of a factor that played, it's hard to tell. Interestingly, um, I believe that uh, Mr. Conway carried Rowan County. I know my son did, and I know other Democrats did, and I think he did too. And uh, of course, that's where she's the county clerk. Now it's a university town, and so. Uh, but it, but so, uh, I have not seen any polling or any other kind of empirical evidence that would really tell us uh, kind of what role that played in it. Um, I'm sure that was an undercurrent. Um, you know, outsider versus insider was an undercurrent. Um, uh, Obama was uh, a part of the campaign because he's not very popular in Kentucky. Uh, low turnout was a big part of it and, and who really showed up to vote. So I think all of those things played a part in it. Um, I really think we did the right thing in, number one, appealing the case. Uh, if you think back, at the time we got a district court opinion in Kentucky that our constitutional amendment was unconstitutional. Um, there were decisions going on all over this country at the federal court level, at the district court level, and it, it was almost chaos. I mean, it, it, you, you were having opinions uh, in some parts of the state, one, uh, of the country one way and some parts the other. I felt that this was an issue whose time had come, that we needed to finally get a United States Supreme Court decision so that we would all know what the law is. 
And then whatever the law is, that's what we will do. And so that's why I appealed it up to the Supreme Court. We got the decision. And then I did what I said I would do. Whatever the court said, that's, that's what the law is going to be in the country. And Kentuckians are law-abiding citizens. So I advised our clerks and everybody else. I said, this is now the law of the land. And we need to implement this law uh, efficiently and without issue. And I'm proud to say that I think 117 of our 120 county clerks did just that. And I know that many of them probably personally felt uh, differently uh, on that issue, but they didn't let that get in the way of doing their job. Uh, they'd been elected by the people to do a job. Uh, the job required issuing licenses and, and upholding the Constitution. And once the Supreme Court said what the Constitution was, then that's what, uh, uh, that's what they did. Um, we had one or two, as, as we all well know. Uh, we got to read it all over the national newspapers and uh, all of that for a while, which I don't think anybody was really excited about uh, in terms of the publicity uh, that it gave Kentucky, but there was not much you can do about that. I mean, that's, that's the way the world turns. Uh, uh, but what it played, you know, in Kentucky, I don't know. But I, I'll say this. Think about for a moment if I hadn't appealed that decision. I bet we would have had 80 to 90 Kim Davises in this state because we wouldn't have had any Supreme Court decision telling us what the law is. We would have just had another district court decision. And I think the fact that we took the case up on appeal got a final decision out of it. I think most Kentuckians, even though I think the latest poll I saw indicated that it's about 60-40, uh, still against gay marriage. Um, I think most Kentuckians feel like they had their day in court. You know, they got to take it all the way up. The Supreme Court made their decision. They may not like it, but that's the law of the land, and it's time to move on. And uh, so I think that's another benefit of the fact that we appealed it up, is that Kentuckians, by and large, accepted it uh, as the law of the land, and they're ready to move on. Um, as far as my personal feelings go, um, I'll get around to that one of these days, just not today. Good afternoon, and uh, thanks for giving us this last interview as you headed out, but I wanted to ask you something about something, a, a current event, something that you had said yesterday, and I wondered if uh, maybe you could give us a little more uh, detail into it. You had made your comment about Syrian refugees and the state of Kentucky and what your right. stance is as governor, and you had mentioned that you felt Kentuckians should do the Christian thing and be their brother's keeper. Do you feel that those governors who have said that they won't accept Syrian refugees, or those who say that when they become governor won't become won't accept Syrian refugees, aren't doing that thing? Or what does your statement say about those people? Well, first of all, Kentucky and the state of Kentucky and the governor of Kentucky really has no say in who gets to be a refugee in this country. That's up to the State Department uh, and and those folks that are accepted into the refugee program are vetted by the State Department, by the FBI, by Homeland Security. It's a process that takes upwards to two years. Right now in Kentucky, I believe I'm right, that we have about 89 Syrian refugees. The last one left Syria in 2012. So that just kind of gives you an indication of how long that vetting process takes uh, and how much vetting there is. Uh, certainly, public safety is one of the top priorities of any governor. And I don't blame governors for wanting to make sure that their people are safe. I, I'm the same way. I want to make sure our people are safe. Uh, but when I look at this process, I'm not sure how much safer we can be uh, because, I mean, there's an extremely strong vetting process. I understand that they may even be beefing it up again because of all the concern. Um, and, uh, you know, my position was if we can make sure that these folks are victims and that's, I mean, look, we all saw the, we all saw the photographs of these kids washing up on the shores of the Mediterranean and, and these families that are, that are in crisis and, and they've done nothing except be at the wrong place at the wrong time and they're just simply looking for a safe haven uh, to, to try to make their families safe. And, you know, if we, if we do all this vetting and can be assured that these people are victims, then America has always been a, a welcoming nation in terms of 
helping people when they're in crisis. And I see no reason to, to change that. You know, after 9-11, I mean, that's awful tragedy that happened on our shores. I mean, we didn't shut down our borders to anybody from Iraq or Afghanistan. I mean, they still went through those same vetting processes. So um, I just don't think we ought to overreact. Uh, and, and, I, and I think we, we should use common sense, just like we've always done. Hello, Governor. Um, coal production has declined precipitously in Kentucky, and uh, fewer than 10,000 coal miners are employed in the state now. Um, yet it still remains a really hot-button political issue for people running for governor and pretty much any office in Kentucky. Do you think it still should be? Well, coal is a still a very important part of our economy. You're exactly right that it has, uh, the, un the employment in the coal fields has dropped precipitously, uh, very rapidly, and is now less than 10,000, I think, across the state. That's still 10,000 jobs or 9,500 jobs, whatever that actual number is. And, and coal still keeps a lot of lights on uh, around the country. So as far as I'm concerned, it will always be, for the foreseeable future, an integral part of our economy. It's never going to employ the number of people that it once did. And I think even people in eastern Kentucky are finally realizing that. Uh, and it's, it's based on that realization that Hal Rogers and I, Hal Rogers, the Republican uh, congressman from that area of Kentucky who is the chairman of the House Appropriations Committee, we teamed up together, Republican and Democrat, to form the Shaping Our Appalachian Region initiative. And it is aimed at working with the people in eastern Kentucky to diversify that economy because we're never going to employ that many people in the coal industry again. And if our people want to stay in eastern Kentucky, live in eastern Kentucky, raise their kids in eastern Kentucky, then we've got to diversify that economy and create jobs there that will uh, enable our folks to do that. Um, it's not going to be easy. It is a long-term 20, 25-year process. And the only way it will be successful is if the people of that region take ownership of it. And so far, we, that's what we're seeing. We're seeing a lot of people in eastern Kentucky coming together and being willing to work to, to try to diversify that economy. You know, we're taking some big steps. Uh, the Mountain Parkway four-laning uh, will, in essence, create an interstate-type system through that part of eastern Kentucky. When you look at any interstate, you see the development that comes off of those interstates. And I think we will see that in eastern Kentucky. The broadband initiative that I mentioned earlier will, as much as anything we can do for Eastern Kentucky, I think in the next 20 years, uh, create the potential for more jobs uh, because you, you'll be able to create the entrepreneurial kinds of jobs. You'll, you'll be able to have small businesses locate there and do business around the world uh, because they do it on, online and, and over the internet. So. Um, you know, I think I think coal will be with us, but it, it'll never be what it is today, what it has been. Can I just add one thing with that too? Eco economics plays a major factor in this. It is so much cheaper to mine coal in other parts of of this country, Montana and other places, than it is in Eastern Kentucky. So, when people when the market is there and they're looking to buy coal, most people are going to buy it at the at the best price. And so that has been a, a major factor in, in changing the dynamics of the industry in, in all of Kentucky. Well, in that whole industry, you know, as Jane mentioned, um, the price of coal uh, in particularly eastern Kentucky as opposed to any place else in the country is high. It's almost uncompetitive because most of the easy coal's been mined in eastern Kentucky, so then now you're down to the hard to mine stuff and it just costs so much more to get out of the ground. And so it's, it's getting very uh, uncompetitive with, with coal from any place else. Secondly, the availability now of cheap natural gas um, has changed the landscape with the fracking process that has, has come online now and the ability to get all of this natural gas out of the ground. All of your, all of your electric utilities are now transitioning their, their uh, uh, plants to gas-fired plants as opposed to coal-fired plants. And that's a 20 to 25-year decision. 
because that, that's how long those plants last. So once these utilities make that decision, they're locked in for a long time. And, and, and that means that coal is locked out of those kind of plants for a long time. So uh, obviously the regulatory environment has been tough. Uh, these new rules that have come out, uh, if, they're, if they're implemented, will basically prevent any new coal-fired power plants from ever being built and will make it all, very difficult to convert any of the current coal-fired power plants to, to meet the, the standards that are out there. So all of that together has, has created this dynamic. Now, we can either sit back and just say, gee whiz, that's terrible, or we can do something about it. And what we're trying to do is diversify that economy so that folks can stay and live and work and enjoy those mountains uh, for years and years to come. Uh, governor, you and I are of a generation, I grew up, being governor of Kentucky was the best political job uh, that anyone in this state could imagine. Uh, it's changed somewhat over the years. Was there a moment in your eight years where you were heartbroken or frustrated and felt powerless that being governor couldn't get done what you wanted and needed to get done? Well, I still remember um, the campaign in 2007 when uh, we had great ideas. We wanted to invest a lot of money in early childhood education because we knew that from a long-term uh, investment perspective, that was one of the best things we could do for, for Kentucky over a generation. And we, just, we had all these great ideas, and then we get elected in a month. I mean, I think three weeks into my, well, let me back up. The day after I was sworn in, I came into the office and my budget director looked at me and said, well, I hope you enjoyed yesterday because we're going to have to cut about $340 million out of the budget to keep it balanced. Now, that was my welcome to being governor of the Commonwealth of Kentucky. And from there, it went downhill because that's just the recession starting to hit. And, uh, you know, over the course now of eight years, I have cut $1.6 billion in spending out of our budgets. Some of it could go out and not, not be missed. A lot of it, we hurt a lot of programs because we had to, because we've got to balance our budget and you've got to balance it with the revenues that you had. Um, so I can still remember, uh, I think during those first budget uh, crisis periods where we were trying to figure out just what do you cut the least? You know, that was the decisions you were making. I think Jane turned to me and said, are we enjoying ourselves yet? You know? <laughs> that was with the ice storm, the tornadoes, the budget, the, budget. the recession. But uh, I'll tell you, the first budget was very difficult to go through because you come into this job looking forward to doing positive things, of investing in the future for our people and for our kids. and. Uh, and then you're hit in the face with, a, with an economic crisis that you didn't cause, but now you've got to deal with. And unlike the federal government, we can't print money here. We've got to only spend as much as we have. And thank goodness that's the way we are. But that meant, uh, you know, we just had to cut the heck out of a lot of stuff. Now, you know, I think the one decision I made that long term paid off for us and gave us a quicker recovery uh, than a lot of states uh, from the recession was the decision on how to cut our budget. Um, many states during that time, uh, if, if they needed X amount of dollars, they just cut everything across the board. You know, we'll cut everything 5% or we'll cut everything 7% and that balances our budget. We didn't do it like that. We, it was harder the way we did it, but I think it was smarter. You know, we decided what were the most important things that this state does. And everything in the budget is important to somebody, but there are a few things that are more important than the others, in my view. And the most important thing was education, was funding for classroom education, K through 12. And so we kept that funding constant. And that's a big item in the budget. It's a lot of money, but we didn't cut classroom funding. Uh, we didn't cut public safety. You know, we, we were very careful with economic development because we wanted to uh, have the ability to create as many jobs as we could during, during a very down period of time. 
Uh, but what that meant is when we preserved those things, we didn't cut, cut teacher pay, we didn't, we didn't cut any of those things. What that meant was that we had to cut everything else a lot more. And there were some agencies in state government that were cut 30 and 40 percent during this time. Now, any business man or woman out here that, that runs their own business, you know, if they just stop and think, what if somebody came to me tomorrow and said, okay, you know, we're going to take 30 to 40 percent of your revenue away, but we expect you to do the same thing with your business that you've been doing and do just as many services and goods for people and, and uh, you just carry right on. Um, it's one heck of a challenge and, and I must say our people stepped up for it. Um, our leaders and our cabinets and the, and the everyday folks that are there working every day, uh, they sucked it up and they decided, you know what, we're going to make this work no matter what we got or don't have. And because of that, I think we, we got through that worst part and we preserved that educational foundation that I think a lot of states hurt when they cut their education foundation. And because of that, we were able to kind of spring off of that and, and off, of, off of the economic development work that we invested in with changing all of our tax incentives and business incentive programs. And I think we really recovered faster than most places because of it. I guess. Not only from what he's talking about, but he and all of his senior staff and all of the cabinet took a 10 percent reduction in their salary until the recession was over. Actually, he did until this last you know, this last year, probably still, and he just hadn't told me. <laughs> um, but I will tell you that I have never seen a person, and you know, Steve and I've been married for 46 years. But I've never seen a person invest themselves in a job like he has this one. From the day he took office, he was there at every budget meeting from dawn, well, 24 hours until they got the budget done. There was not one thing that went through that budget that he wasn't a part of. Understanding it, um, agreeing, discussing it. And he's done that with everything that he has done throughout this administration. Um, he has worked 24-7 for eight years. And it has, um, it's paid off. You know, I think he's, you know, frustration, some days frustration, some um, issues frustrating. But by and large, he's enjoyed every moment of what he's done. Thank you. Governor, two-part question. Will there be any money for the new governor? What kind of situation will he inherit? And also, when you ran both times for governor, you made a lot about expanded gambling. And as you know, it didn't come through. Right. The early years, a lot of blame put on then Senate President David Williams. He left, but still, it never got to be. Do you think Kentucky will ever have expanded gambling, or should we just everyone forget about that cause? Well, let me take your second one first. Um, I don't know if we'll ever have it. Um, I did learn in this whole process. You know, first it was David Williams, uh, but, but, you know, I solved that problem at, at some point. Um, but in the end, that is one of these issues that even the people who say they're for it, many of them are only for it as long as you do it the way they want to do it. And so in our whole horse industry, you've got the racetracks divided up. Some are for it only if we get it. Some are for it okay, even though there's a freestanding casino or two. Uh, some of your other horse people, the breeders, the owners, some are for it, some are against it. And it was like herding a bunch of cats. You know, you, you never could get them all circled around one wagon and, and supporting one idea. Uh, and it's a hard enough issue if you've got that. But when you've got the people that supposedly are in favor of this going off in all different directions, you really don't have a chance. Uh, particularly when it's got to be a constitutional amendment, which requires, you know, a 60% majority in both houses as opposed to just a simple majority. Um, so it's just a tough issue and, and I don't know if they'll ever get there. Um, now, what was your first one? Uh, Mr. Babin, what will he oh. here? This incoming administration is going to be in the best position 
uh, to write a budget uh, since before I came into office. Um, every year I've been in, I've had to cut the budget. Uh, this year, they're going to have uh, a growing economy. Uh, I just deposited, what, $82 million into the rainy day fund, so that has grown even more. And our, our revenues every month are, are continuing to grow. Last month, we had a, over a 6% growth in, in revenues for the month. Um, and that is a huge growth compared to, to the kinds of things that we went through. So uh, it won't be perfect. I mean, it's always tough, and there is never enough money. I can tell you that, uh, because you have a lot of things you want to do, and in the end, there's never enough money to do it all. So you always are going to have to make hard decisions. You've got to balance things uh, against each other. He'll probably have to cut some things in order to invest in other things he wants to do. But he's going to have more money to do that with than I've had any time in my administration. And I'm glad uh, because what that tells me is our economy is moving in the right direction. It is booming right now. And even with the problems in the coal industry, even with losing that many jobs that fast, our unemployment rate's 5 percent statewide. I mean, that's lower than the national average. That's the lowest it's been in two decades. So uh, things, things are really moving in the right direction, uh, and I, I just I hope that they'll keep it moving that way. Uh, thank you, Governor. Um, there are well over 100,000 former nonviolent felons in Kentucky who cannot vote. Have you considered a blanket pardon on such people to allow them to vote? And secondly, the Kentucky Domestic Violence Association has long sought for pardons for a number of women who killed their abusers. Have you considered any of those uh, pardons for those people? Well, let me talk about both of those subjects because they're a little different. One is a, is a restoration of rights and the other is pardons. And um, the restorations of rights process right now in Kentucky um, is still in the sole hands of the governor. You know, a lot of states have made it automatic. Uh, and uh, we ought to be, make it automatic, honestly, that when you've served your time out and, and, uh, and you paid your restitution and all of that, and you're trying to become a productive member of society again, part of your integration back into society is the right to vote. Uh, it's just a basic right that you ought to have, assuming that you paid your debt. Um, and so uh, we're going to have an announcement in the next few days uh, about the restoration of rights process. Um, and and uh, that's, that's where I'll stop on that right now, but, but we have been working on the idea of, of trying to make it more automatic uh, than it is right now, trying to afford that opportunity to more people. Um, and so um, we'll, we'll talk more about that in the next few days. Um, in terms of pardons, uh, it is traditional in Kentucky that at the end of a governor's term when you're going out of office that you consider the idea of pardoning uh, uh, people. And uh, as you can imagine, in eight years, uh, we have received, uh, this won't be an exact number, but I'd say uh, you know, about 5,000 applications uh, for pardons. And we're going through them all right now. Uh, I haven't made any decisions yet, but I, I feel like I owe it to all of those people to look at their, their cases and, uh, uh, and then try to make a decision. Uh, I also have the ones that uh, the Domestic Violence Association has sent over uh, of uh, women who uh, uh, in domestic violence situations uh, ended up killing their husbands, and so I'm taking a look at that too. Your, one of your last public appearances will be at the downtown Louisville Bridge that you mentioned. Um, will you take that opportunity to name the bridge, or have you considered a name, and then uh, secondly, uh, your first day out of office, uh, the first day after eight years of all day, all night, uh, handling the business of the Commonwealth, what will be the first thing on your agenda? <laughs> I hope I'll sleep late, uh, but my guess is I won't. Uh, I'll wake up and go, how come my phone's not ringing? Uh, but, uh, uh, you know, Jane and I are going to take a little time. I won't, 
I won't retire in the in the traditional sense. I don't think because that's just not me. I, I'm going to have to keep busy doing some things, and uh, I've got a number of things that I'm starting to think about now, and and we'll see kind of where all that goes. Uh, but uh, I think right toward the end, and I don't know if we've set a date yet, Terry. Have we announced a date where we're going to do that bridge walkover? Uh, Saturday, December fifth. Yeah, December fifth. And, uh, and I've been thinking about a name for that bridge, so I wouldn't be too surprised if, if that bridge got named uh, sometime between now and December the, the 7th. Um, let me say one last thing, too, uh, on, a, on a topic that we've kind of oh, hit around, but uh, that we ought to talk about directly for a minute, and that is how we have been able here in Kentucky to make democracy work pretty well. And I've said from time to time, Kentucky may be one of the few places left in the United States where democracy still works. And by that I mean simply Democrats and Republicans working together to move the government and the state forward. Uh, we all know what goes on in Washington, D.C., and it's very obvious that democracy is in trouble when it comes to the federal government because no one works with anybody. No one talks to anybody. Uh, all they do is yell at each other and then walk out and raise more money so they can run for re-election and yell at each other some more. Uh, that's not the way we have conducted business here in the Commonwealth. We haven't been perfect. Uh, we've had our partisan squabbles. But from the very beginning, when I ran in 2007, I said, I don't really care whether it's uh, a Democratic idea or a Republican idea, if it's a good idea, we ought to get together and make it happen. And, you know, I started working on that as after I came into office at the end of 2007. It was a slow process for a while, but as we've moved along in this eight years, uh, we have reached a point in this state to where, for the most part, uh, we run our campaigns on a partisan basis. That's the way they are. We go at it tooth and toenail. But after they're over with, uh, more often than not, we've been able to remember that we're Kentuckians first and Democrats and Republicans second. And because we've been able to do that, that's how we've gotten these things done. That's how we passed the domestic violence rec uh, legislation, the booster seat legislation, the dropout legislation. All of these things that we've been able to do that have been kind of stuck like a dam there you know, we finally broke that dam open and we got things moving and Democrats and Republicans joined together and made that happen. Uh, it's because of good leadership in the House and Senate. Robert Stivers, as, as uh, Senate President, uh, has been a, a joy to work with. Not that we agree on everything, we're of different philosophies, different parties, but, uh, but he is the kind of person that will sit down with you and work through issues, find common ground, and his interest is in moving the state forward. The same thing can be said for Greg Stumbo, Speaker of the House. Greg and I have been friends a long time. We're obviously of the same political party, and, and our philosophies are probably more akin than my philosophy with Robert Stivers. But the three of us, and then the leadership in, in each of the House joining, each of those houses joining with them, have been able to put aside partisan differences so many times to make good things happen for this state. And very thankful for that because, uh, because of that, uh, we're where we are today. And I, I hope that that continues. So thank you all very much. Thank you, Governor. Thank you, Governor.